The Bloodline Elite's Agenda, their great work, which is nothing short of world domination, has exoterically been called the New World Order by many politicians and Masonic authors. The Old World Order was characterized by monarchies, countries with independent standing armies, medals, and fiat currency. The New World Order will be characterized by one world government, open borders, a world army, world court, and a world cashless, credit-based currency managed via microchips. David Icke wrote, The Illuminati can be traced back thousands of years to Sumer, Babylon, Egypt, and still further into what we call prehistory. Through the centuries they have been working constantly to centralize power and complete their great work, world dictatorship. Behind the apparent randomness of world events, has been the Illuminati secret network that is privy to knowledge the rest of the people never hear about. The network is controlled by ancient interbreeding bloodlines and their offshoots headed today by some 13 elite families, which are structured in a DNA hierarchy. These include the Rothschilds, Rockefellers, House of Lorraine, Habsburgs, and the Thurn and Taxis dynasty from Bergamo. I would emphasize that I am exposing an agenda not a conspiracy as such. The conspiracy comes in manipulating people and events to ensure the agenda is introduced. These conspiracies take three main forms. Conspiring to remove people and organizations that are a threat to the agenda, such as the assassination of Diana, Princess of Wales. Conspiring to put people into positions of power who will make the agenda happen, such as George Bush, Henry Kissinger, Tony Blair, etc and conspiring to create events which will make the public demand the agenda is introduced through problem-reaction-solution. Wars, bombs, economic collapses. In this way, all these apparently unconnected events and manipulations become aspects of the same conspiracy to introduce the same agenda. Paul Joseph Watson wrote, The New World Order is not a conspiracy in the strictest sense of the term, it is an agenda. The agenda is orchestrated by a power elite that thinks it has the divine right to commandeer total control of your life. But who are they? Who are the power elite? The UN, the EU, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderberg Group, the Trilateral Commission, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, the Club of Rome. The list goes on and there have been many books written that cover the history of these groups and how they connect to each other. The agenda is a worldwide consolidation and centralization of power into the hands of an all-encompassing world government. This system will evolve from the European Union, already in place, the American Union, derived from NAFTA, and the Asian Union. When these three models are in existence, they will be merged together to create the one world government. When confronted with a conspiracy of this magnitude, many say it is impossible, because someone would have spilled the beans. If there was a huge worldwide conspiracy for world government, someone would come out and say something. The fact is that congressmen, senators, secret society members, and Illuminists themselves have publicly stated and written entire books about what they are doing. When asked how the American people would respond to the inconsistencies of the JFK assassination and Warren Commission report, CIA Director Alan Dulles simply said, The American people don't read. The conspirators know the general public doesn't read, and the books they write don't attract popular readership. As G. Edward Griffin said, The past record of man is burdened with accounts of assassinations, secret combines, palace plots and betrayals in war. But in spite of this clear record, an amazing number of people have begun to scoff at the possibility of conspiracy at work today. They dismiss such an idea as merely a conspiratorial view. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover said, The individual is handicapped by coming face to face with a conspiracy so monstrous he cannot believe it exists and U.S. Ambassador Joseph P. Kennedy said, 50 men have run America, and that's a high figure. 
there exists a semi-secret cabal of globalists bent on one world government under the United Nations, world military through expansion of NATO, world bank and cashless currency, and a microchipped population. The conspirators are a group of bankers, businessmen, politicians, media owners and personalities, Illuminati families, and secret society elites. They implement their power through the vehicles of Freemasonry, the Bilderberg Group, Bohemian Grove, Skull and Bones, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, and the Committee of 300, to name just a few. Their agenda for world governance has been known to secret society elites and Illuminati families for centuries as the Great Work, though nowadays it is politically referred to as the New World Order. David Icke wrote, The Illuminati structure can be symbolized as a web or as a pyramid in which the few at the top dictate to the many at the bottom. The many are kept in ignorance of what is really going on. The pyramid structure of secret societies is mirrored in government, banking, business, and every other organization and institution. Only the few at the top of the pyramids know the real agenda and what the organization is trying to achieve. The further you go down the pyramid, the more people are working for the organization, but the less they know about its real agenda. They are only aware of the individual job they do every day. They don't know how their contribution, apparently innocent in isolation, connects with those of other employees in other areas of the company, government, or whatever. They are compartmentalized, and the only people who know how it all fits together are the very few sitting at the top, the bloodline families and their lackeys. The smaller pyramids, like the local branch of a bank, fit into bigger and bigger pyramids, until eventually you have the pyramid that encompasses all of the banks. It is the same with the transnational corporations, political parties, secret societies, media empires, and the military. If you go high enough in this structure, all the transnational corporations, like the oil cartel, major political parties, secret societies, media empires, and the military, via NATO for instance, are controlled by the same families who sit atop the biggest pyramids. In the end, there is a worldwide pyramid that includes all the others. At the capstone of this, you will find the most elite of the Illuminati, the purest of their bloodlines. In this way, they can coordinate through apparently unconnected, even opposing areas of society, the same policies. All roads lead eventually to them. The New World Order is already nearly complete with the United Nations increasingly assuming the role of world government. The world court already exists in the Netherlands. NATO is in place to expand into the world army. World Bank and IMF are centralizing banking, and union currencies like the euro are consolidating world currency. The European Union has centralized Europe. The North American Union is now underway, and so is the Asian Union. The end result and stated mission is world government under the unelected communist-based United Nations. They want to have one all-powerful world king or president with a world army at his disposal. They want a top-down system of world governance that dictates world law from a centralized body and complete interdependence of all nations, economically, politically, and militarily. Alex Jones wrote, The New World Order system of world conquest has always been visible, but it is so hulking and massive that it has remained hidden in plain sight. One of the most common preconditioned responses I hear from the average compartmentalized individual is that there couldn't be a society of people working for world government. Those in denial proclaim, it's too big, it would unravel, they couldn't keep it hidden. The average person judges the world according to their moral compass because most individuals are not ruthless sociopathic control freaks, they cannot even begin to fathom the dark gulfs that are the souls of the servants of the global elite. The New World Order is a synthesis of the survivors of empires, of super-merchant families, of barbarian kings, of banking families established in the Middle Ages, and of the royal families of Europe. Over time, they have learned that if they can simply conceal the true magnitude of their power, and install puppet rulers from the cultures they dominate, the people will accept greater forms of tyranny. In the late 20th century, 
As the formation of a true world government entered its final stages, the globalists began to do what was unthinkable just a few years before. They began to admit that there really was a move towards a new world order, complete with a world court, world taxes, and a world army to enforce its despotic laws. Just a few years ago, the average man on the street refused to even admit the possibility of a world government. Now that same individual will bellow, yes, there's a world government, and we need it to protect ourselves. The globalists' plan is so far along that now they must admit that world government is a reality. Their propagandists are hailing the new world order as the only system that will keep us safe and secure. For decades now, politicians, the corporate controlled media, and public schools have been promoting this one world agenda as being an inevitable, advantageous step forward for humanity. They said a world government, world army, and currency will unite us as a world community, putting an end to all wars and poverty. This is simply not true. There have been more wars fought in the years since the 1945 forming of the United Nations than in the rest of recorded history before the UN, over 140 wars. This means the United Nations has failed its single reason for existence, to end all wars. In an address delivered before the Union League of Philadelphia in 1915, Nicholas Murray Butler said, The old world order changed when this war storm broke. The old international order passed away as suddenly, as unexpectedly, and as completely as if had been wiped out by a gigantic flood, by a great tempest, or by a volcanic eruption. The old world order died with the setting of that day's sun, and a new world order is being born while I speak, with birth pangs so terrible that it seems almost incredible that life could come out of such fearful suffering and such overwhelming sorrow. After World War I, the Treaty of Versailles created the League of Nations, which was exoterically promoted as a vehicle for world peace, but esoterically the globalists' first attempt at world government. The League of Nations failed in both uniting world governments and promoting world peace. The Treaty of Versailles also failed and was denounced for imposing impossible reparations payments on the German people, payments which created the economic hardships that led to the rise of National Socialism and Hitler. At the time, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson said regarding the treaty, If I were a German, I think I should never sign it. British Prime Minister David Lloyd George said, We have written a document that guarantees war in 20 years. When you place conditions on a people, Germany, that it cannot possibly keep, you force it to either breach the agreement or to war. Either we modify that agreement and make it tolerable to the German people, or when the new generation comes along, they will try again. Fritz Springmeier wrote, At the end of the war in 1919, the Treaty of Versailles meetings were attended by Rothschild-connected men like Paul and Max Warburg, John Foster Dulles, Colonel House, Thomas Lamont, and Alan Dulles. The harsh terms of the Treaty of Versailles totally set the stage for World War II. Said one delegate, This is no peace. This is only a truce for twenty years. Sure enough, in 1939, the Second World War started. Another product of the Versailles meetings was the elite's charter for the League of Nations, the Illuminati's first attempt at creating a world institution. The League of Nations failed. This called for the need to create a think tank and special interest organization that could promote the New World Order, thus the creation of the Foreign Relations Institutions, the CFR, RIIA, etc. Around the same time as the Treaty of Versailles, higher-ups in the conspiratorial pyramid met in secret at the Hotel Majestic in Paris. Out of these meetings was created the American Council on Foreign Relations and the British Royal Institute of International Affairs, with funding from Cecil Rhodes, the Rockefellers and Rothschilds, among others. The stated mission of the CFR is to erode America's national sovereignty into a one-world government. In 1919, M. C. Alexander, Executive Secretary of the American Association for International Consolation, said, The Peace Conference has assembled. It will make the most momentous decisions in history, and upon these decisions 
will rest the stability of the new world order and the future peace of the world. Alex Jones said, The League convened in Paris in 1919, but many nations recognized it as a threat to their sovereignty and refused to join. Frustrated by the U.S. Congress blocking the League of Nations, British intelligence, with the help of the Rockefeller family, set up the Council on Foreign Relations in New York City in 1921. The Council recruited the best and brightest of American life to support the growth of the Anglo-American Empire. The CFR's stated mission is to abolish all nation-states in favor of an all-powerful world government administered by a tiny elite. Having established the League of Nations, the Council on Foreign Relations, and the Royal Institute of International Affairs, the globalists had successfully began the transition from Old World National Independence to New World International Interdependence. In 1927, Dr. Augustus Thomas, President of the World Federation of Education, said, If there are those who think we are to jump immediately into a New World Order, they are doomed to disappointment. If we are ever to approach that time, it will be after patient and persistent effort of long duration. The present international situation of mistrust and fear can only be corrected by a formula of equal status, continuously applied to every phase of international contacts, until the cobwebs of the old order are brushed out of the minds of the people of all lands. H. G. Wells, the famous author of Time Machine, War of the Worlds, and the Invisible Man was secretly a member of British Intelligence, Committee of 300, a Mason, and a Fabian. He was very familiar with the One World Agenda and wrote many books outlining it with titles like The Open Conspiracy, The Shape of Things to Come, World Brain, A Modern Utopia, and The New World Order. H. G. Wells wrote, The political world of the open conspiracy must weaken, efface, incorporate, and supersede existing governments. The open conspiracy is the natural inheritor of socialist and communist enthusiasms. It may be in control of Moscow before it is in control of New York. The character of the open conspiracy will now be plainly displayed. It will be a world religion. The open conspiracy will appear first, I believe, as a conscious organization of intelligent, and in some cases wealthy men, as a movement having distinct social and political aims, confessedly ignoring most of the existing apparatus of political control, or using it only as an incidental implement in the stages, a mere movement of a number of people in a certain direction, who will presently discover, with a sort of a surprise, the common object toward which they are all moving. In all sorts of ways, they will be influencing and controlling the ostensible government. Writing books like The Open Conspiracy and explaining outright the nature of their plans for scientific dictatorships, the conspirators hide out in the open. By reading about our ever-encroached-upon freedom, we accept it as inevitable. It's called predictive programming, and continues being used today in books, magazines, movies, and other forms of mass media. The ideas are propagated into the public mind as hypotheticals or science fiction. This desensitizes and preconditions populations to accept the incremental implementation of these supposedly fictitious scientific dictatorships. As the worldwide technocracy creeps up around us, we have already been subconsciously programmed to accept such a future. Fabians like H. G. Wells, who wrote so eloquently on the New World Order, with such books as The New World Order, A Modern Utopia, The Open Conspiracy, blueprints for a world revolution, was a wolf in sheep's clothing. H. G. Wells made the New World Order something that sounded advantageous to everyone, a utopia of sorts. That is not what it will be. In 1933, H. G. Wells published The Shape of Things to Come, which was supposedly a science fiction work about a world state ruled by a benevolent dictatorship. However, this book accurately predicted the Second World War to start around 1940, originating from a German-Polish dispute. It went on to predict that the agenda for world government would succeed on its third attempt around 1980, following some events that would occur in Iraq. Though 1980 was slightly early, Wells's prophecy certainly seems to be coming to fruition now. H. G. Wells wrote, 
Although world government had been plainly coming for some years, although it had been endlessly feared and murmured against, it found no opposition prepared anywhere. The Fabian Society, to which H. G. Wells belonged, has also been instrumental in bringing about the New World Order. Their stated mission is to advance the socialist cause by gradualist and reformist, not revolutionary means. Their logo is a wolf wearing a sheep suit, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Here is a sampling of Fabian thought. Sidney Webb, the founder of the Fabian Society, said, To play those millions of minds, to watch them slowly respond to an unseen stimulus, to guide their aspirations without their knowledge, all this, whether in high capacities or in humble, is a big and endless game of chess, of ever extraordinary excitement. Alice Bailey, a cultist, Fabian, and head of the Lucius Trust, wrote, Behind the division of humanity stand those enlightened ones, whose right and privilege it is to watch over human evolution and to guide the destinies of men. This they do through the implanting of ideas in the minds of the world thinkers, so that these ideas in due time receive recognition and eventually become controlling factors in human life. They train the members of the new group of world servers in the task of changing these ideas into ideals. These in turn become the desired objectives of the thinkers and are then taught to the powerful middle class and worked up into world forms of governments or religions, thus forming the basis of the new world order. In 1933, 33rd degree Mason and President FDR introduced the Great Seal on the back of the dollar bill, which still includes the Latin Novos Ordo Seclorum, translating New Secular Order, or New World Order. Shortly thereafter, in 1939, H. G. Wells wrote his book entitled The New World Order, in which he advocates a one-world centralized government. He wrote, when the struggle seems to be drifting definitely towards a world social democracy, there may still be very great delays and disappointments before it becomes an efficient and beneficent world system. Countless people will hate the new world order, and will die protesting against it. When we attempt to evaluate its promise, we have to bear in mind the distress of a generation or so of malcontents, many of them quite gallant and graceful-looking people. In 1940, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace published The New World Order, which included ideas about a world federation with special plans for world order to be implemented upon ending the Second World War. On June 28, 1945, six weeks before the atomic ending of World War II, 33rd President and 33rd Degree Freemason Harry Truman endorsed world government, saying, it will be just as easy for nations to get along in a republic of the world as it is for us to get along in a republic of the United States. Then, on October 24, 1945, the United Nations Charter became effective and the fledgling world governmental body was established. Alex Jones wrote, Once again the elite claimed that only world governance could save humanity from certain destruction, and this time the elite would succeed in setting up their world body. In April 1945, the United Nations was founded by the victors of World War II. The United Nations complex was then built in New York City, on land donated by John D. Rockefeller. Shortly after the elite established the United Nations as their base in the United States, the newly formed World Council quickly began work on the next phase in their plan, the incremental formation of continental superstates. The first step in their trilateral plan was the creation of the European Union. Unifying Europe had been tried many times and was extremely unpopular. Where Napoleon and Hitler had failed to accomplish their goals using force, the globalists would succeed using stealth. Fritz Springmeier wrote, World War II facilitated the American acceptance of a world peacekeeping institution, the United Nations. After the U.S. had rejected the first attempt to create such an institution in the League of Nations, the Illuminati decided to create an arm of the Rothschild-funded roundtable groups which could help influence Western society towards the embracement of globalism. In 1948, George Orwell wrote 1984, another quasi-fiction novel 
about the Big Brother Control Grid Surveillance Societies to come. Orwell said, If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. On February 7, 1950, FDR's financial advisor, international banker James Paul Warburg, stated before the United States Senate Foreign Relations Committee that we shall have world government whether or not we like it. The only question is whether world government will be achieved by conquest or consent. Two days later, the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee introduced Senate Concurrent Resolution 66, stating that the United Nations Charter, quote, should be changed to provide a true world government constitution. In 1952, Globalist and Committee of 300 member Bertrand Russell wrote The Impact of Science on Society. Russell, like Wells, wrote extensively about world government and the scientific dictatorships of the future. He wrote, There is, it must be confessed, a psychological difficulty about a single world government. The chief source of social cohesion in the past, I repeat, has been war. The passions that inspire a feeling of unity are hate and fear. These depend upon the existence of an enemy, actual or potential. It seems to me that a world government could only be kept in being by force, not by the spontaneous loyalty that now inspires a nation at war. It is possible nowadays for a government to be very much more oppressive than any government could be before there was scientific technique. Propaganda makes persuasion easier for the government. Public ownership of halls and paper makes counter-propaganda more difficult, and the effectiveness of modern armaments makes popular risings impossible. No revolution can succeed in a modern country unless it has the support of at least a considerable section of the armed forces. But the armed forces can be kept loyal by being given a higher standard of life than that of the average worker, and this is made easier by every step in the degradation of ordinary labor. Thus the very evils of the system help to give it stability. Apart from external pressure, there is no reason why such a regime should not last for a very long time. A scientific world society cannot be stable unless there is a world government which secures universal birth control. There must from time to time be great wars, in which the penalty of defeat is widespread death by starvation. Unless at some stage one power or group of powers emerges victorious and proceeds to establish a single government of the world with a monopoly of armed forces, it is clear that the level of civilization must decline until scientific warfare becomes impossible, that is, until science is extinct. Shortly after Russell's book, fellow Committee of 300 member Aldous Huxley wrote Brave New World about a future pharmacological scientific dictatorship in which the drugged citizens are described as smiling depressives that love their servitude. Aldous Huxley's grandfather, T. H. Huxley, was another Committee of 300 member, known as Darwin's Bulldog, because he rigorously defended evolution and advocated scientism. H. G. Wells knew both Huxley's and considered T. H. to be his mentor. In 1959, Aldous Huxley gave one of his last public speeches called The Final Revolution at UC Medical School, where he stated, There will be in the next generation or so a pharmacological method of making people love their servitude and producing dictatorships without tears, so to speak, producing a kind of painless concentration camp for entire societies, so that people will in fact have their liberties taken away from them, but will rather enjoy it because they will be distracted from any desire to rebel, by propaganda, brainwashing, or brainwashing enhanced by pharmacological methods, and this seems to be the final revolution. The older dictators fell because they could never supply their subjects with enough bread, enough circuses, enough miracles and mysteries. Under a scientific dictatorship, education will really work. Most men and women will grow up to love their servitude, and will never dream of revolution. There seems to be no good reason why a thoroughly scientific dictatorship should ever be overthrown. In his 1962 publication, The Future of Federalism, Bloodline Governor of New York and CFR member Nelson Rockefeller promoted the New World Order, quote, 
the nation-state is becoming less and less competent to perform its international political tasks. These are some of the reasons pressing us to lead vigorously toward a true building of a new world order. Sooner, perhaps, than we may realize, there will evolve the basis for a federal structure of the free world. Years later, on July 26, 1968, campaigning for the presidency, Nelson Rockefeller told the Associated Press that, quote, as president, he would work toward the creation of a new world order. Bloodline President and CFR member Richard Nixon was quoted in the October 1967 Foreign Affairs stating, The developing coherence of Asian regional thinking is reflected in a disposition to consider problems and loyalties in regional terms, and to evolve regional approaches to development needs and to the evolution of a new world order. In 1969, the first black congressman from New York, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., blew the whistle on the David Frost show regarding the secret government. He said on the show that he would probably be killed for going public with everything, and sure enough died suspiciously shortly thereafter. Spignu Brzezinski is a former U.S. National Security Advisor, Trilateral Commission co-founder, member of the CFR, Club of Rome, and Committee of 300. He is a descendant of the Polish black nobility, Old World Order, and associate of Henry Kissinger. In his 1970 book entitled The Technotronic Era, Brzezinski envisioned the globalists' coming dictatorial control grid. Quote, it will soon be possible to assert almost continuous control over every citizen and to maintain up-to-date files containing even the most personal details about health and personal behavior of every citizen in addition to the more customary data. These files will be subject to instantaneous retrieval by the authorities. Power will gravitate into the hands of those who control information. Our existing institutions will be supplanted by pre-crisis management institutions, the task of which will be to identify in advance likely social crises and to develop programs to cope with them. This will encourage tendencies through the next several decades toward a technotronic era, a dictatorship leaving even less room for political procedures as we know them. Finally, looking ahead to the end of the century, the possibility of biochemical mind control and genetic tinkering with man, including beings which will function like men and reason like them as well, could give rise to some difficult questions. John Coleman wrote, Brzezinski is the author of a book that should have been read by every American interested in the future of this country, entitled The Technotronic Era, it was commissioned by the Club of Rome. The book is an open announcement of the manner and methods to be used to control the United States in the future. Brzezinski, speaking for the Committee of 300, said the United States was moving into an era unlike any of its predecessors. We were moving toward a technotronic era that could easily become a dictatorship. Brzezinski went on to say that our society is now in an information revolution based on amusement focus spectator spectacles, saturation coverage by television of sporting events, which provide an opiate for an increasingly purposeless mass. Was Brzezinski another seer and a prophet? Could he see into the future? The answer is no. What he wrote in his book was simply copied from the Committee of 300's blueprint given to the Club of Rome for execution. In the April 1974 issue of the Council on Foreign Relations journal Foreign Affairs, Member Richard N. Gardner wrote, The new world order will have to be built from the bottom up, rather than from the top down. It will look like a great booming, buzzing confusion, to use William James's famous description of reality, but an end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, will accomplish much more than the old-fashioned frontal assault. In October 1975, during an address before the United Nations General Assembly, Henry Kissinger said, My country's history, Mr. President, tells us that it is possible to fashion unity while cherishing diversity, that common action is possible despite the variety of races, interests, and beliefs we see here in this chamber. Progress and peace and justice are attainable. So we say to all peoples and governments, let us fashion together a new world order. Later in October, the 24th, 1975, the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia issued the Declaration of Interdependence, 
signed by 125 members of the House and Senate. It read, When in the course of history the threat of extinction confronts mankind, it is necessary for the people of the United States to declare their interdependence with the people of all nations, and to embrace those principles and build those institutions which will enable mankind to survive and civilization to flourish. Two centuries ago, our forefathers brought forth a new nation. Now we must join with others to bring forth a new world order. Also in 1975, Richard A. Falk wrote a book called On the Creation of a Just World Order. In one section of the book called Towards the New World Order, modest methods, and drastic visions, Falk wrote, The existing order is breaking down at a very rapid rate, and the main uncertainty is whether mankind can exert a positive role in shaping a new world order, or is doomed to await collapse in a passive posture. We believe a new order will be born no later than early in the next century, and that the death throes of the old and the birth pangs of the new will be a testing time for the human species. Another whistle-blowing congressman was Larry P. MacDonald, who was then killed on board a plane suspiciously shot down by Soviets. In 1976, he said, The drive of the Rockefellers and their allies is to create a one-world government combining supercapitalism and communism under the same tent, all under their control. Do I mean conspiracy? Yes, I do. I am convinced there is such a plot, international in scope, generations old in planning, and incredibly evil in intent. Senator Daniel Inouye in 1977 said, There exists a shadowy government with its own air force, its own navy, its own fundraising mechanism, and the ability to pursue its own ideas of national interest, free from all checks and balances, and free from the law itself. In a United Nations address, December 1988, Mikhail Gorbachev said, Further global progress is now possible only through a quest for universal consensus in the movement towards a new world order. In the Wall Street Journal, September 1990, Richard Gephardt wrote, We can see beyond the present shadows of war in the Middle East to a new world order where the strong work together to deter and stop aggression. This was precisely Franklin Roosevelt's and Winton Churchill's vision for peace for the post-war period. President George Bush, in his congressional speech on September 11, 1990, said, The crisis in the Persian Gulf offers a rare opportunity to move toward a historic period of cooperation. Out of these troubled times, a new world order can emerge. In January 1991, President George Bush said, If we do not follow the dictates of our inner moral compass and stand up for human life, then this lawlessness will threaten the peace and democracy of the emerging new world order we now see. This long-dreamed-of vision we've all worked for so long. A. M. Rosenthal in the New York Times in January 1991 wrote, But it became clear as time went on that in Mr. Bush's mind the new world order was founded on a convergence of goals and interests between the U.S. and Soviet Union, so strong and permanent that they would work as a team through the UN Security Council. George McGovern wrote, I would support a presidential candidate who pledged to take the following steps. At the end of the war in the Persian Gulf, press for a comprehensive Middle East settlement and for a new world order based not on Pax Americana, but on peace through law with a stronger UN and world court. President Bush, at his State of the Union address on September 11, 1991, said, what is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve universal aspirations of mankind, peace and security, freedom and the rule of law. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order, can emerge. Now we can see a new world coming into being, a world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. U.S. Ambassador David Funderbunk in 1991 said, George Bush has been surrounding himself with people who believe in one world government. They believe that the Soviet system and American system are converging. The vehicle to bring this about is the United Nations, the majority of whose 166 member states are socialist, 
atheist, and anti-American. Strobe Talbot wrote, In the next century, nations as we know it will be obsolete. All states will recognize a single global authority. National sovereignty wasn't such a great idea after all. In 1992, George Bush said, It is the sacred principles enshrined in the United Nations Charter to which the American people will henceforth pledge their allegiance. A full-page advertisement by the government of Morocco in the New York Times, April 1994, wrote, The final act of the Uruguay Round, marking the conclusion of the most ambitious trade negotiation of our century, will give birth, in Morocco, to the World Trade Organization, the third pillar of the New World Order, along with the United Nations and the International Monetary Fund. In 1994, Henry Kissinger said, The New World Order cannot happen without U.S. participation, as we are the most significant single component. Yes, there will be a New World Order, and it will force the United States to change its perceptions. David Rockefeller, at a UN Ambassador's Dinner, September 23, 1994, said, We are on the verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis, and the nations will accept the New World Order. Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., in the CFR's Foreign Affairs, July 1995, wrote, We are not going to achieve a New World Order without paying for it in blood, as well as in words and money. Brock Chisholm, director of the UN World Health Organization, said, To achieve one world government, it is necessary to remove from the minds of men their individualism, their loyalty to family traditions, and national identification. In 1998, Spignu Brzezinski wrote another book called The Grand Chessboard, in which he compared the elite control of the world to a game of chess and accurately predicted Afghani terror attacks and the rise of the American police state. Alex Jones extrapolates, saying, For decades going back to Jimmy Carter and Zbigniew Brzezinski, the National Security Advisor, the New World Order overlords had been breeding and creating these organizations, funding them, and training them to attack America. Zbigniew Brzezinski, co-founder of the Trilateral Commission, with David Rockefeller and other luminaries of the global system, actually bragged in his 1998 book, The Grand Chessboard, of how America would be attacked by Afghanis. A war for world government would then take place in Central Asia that would be used as reason to roll out national ID cards and a police state here in the United States. According to Brzezinski's book, everything that is happening now was planned decades ago. Brzezinski's book continues to explain how America must survive by following the basic rules of empire and how outside enemies are needed to mobilize the population behind the Imperium's hegemony. Just three days after the 9-11 attacks on the Pentagon and World Trade Center, CFR member Gary Hart said on C-SPAN, quote, There is a chance for the President of the United States to use this disaster to carry out a phrase his father used, and that is, a new world order. In his 2002 memoirs, David Rockefeller openly admitted conspiring with other globalists towards a one world order. Quote, Some even believe we, the Rockefeller family, are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty, and I am proud of it. Pope John Paul II stated at the World Day of Peace homily on January 1st, 2004 that, quote, people are becoming more and more aware of the need for a new international order. With the success of Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth movie, which should be called Convenient Half-Truths, and a UN panel's worth of poor science from the IPCC, the globalists are hoping to convince us that a world carbon tax will save us from global warming. In 2007, British Prime Minister Gordon Brown said, a new world order is required to deal with the climate change crisis. And in a book by Al Gore called Earth in Balance, he prophesizing a coming global Marshall Plan to help the Earth and its people, quote, We are close to a time when all of humankind will envision a global agenda that encompasses a kind of global Marshall Plan to address the causes of poverty and suffering 
and environmental destruction all over the earth.